Welcome. Good morning. You're in for a treat. Um, thank you for your fortitude in continuing to care um, and have an appetite for the only thing that I ever hear about ever, the uh, constitutionality of the Affordable Care Act and its central minimum coverage provision. Uh, we have today with us really the ideal uh, combatants to um, illuminate for us the central issues and positions and after some opening remarks from them, I'm going to, because it's a Saturday morning and because it was so easy to do, uh, hit them with questions that may sound familiar to you uh, from the arguments that took place uh, in March. Uh, so with us today are Steve Bradbury, who's a partner at Deckard, uh, was head of the OLC, had a distinguished run in the Justice Department in the Bush administration, and Walter Dellinger, well known to the ACS, uh, who's a partner at O'Melveny, um, was acting Solicitor General and also head of the OLC in the Clinton administration. So the way we're going to set this up is I've asked each of them to give you a brief overview of the essential issues and the competing positions and then I'm going to hit them with some questions and then when I'm exhausted uh, you guys will join the fray and ask questions of your own. And I think we'll start with Steve. Adam, <clears throat> thank you and thanks to the Society for the kind invite. It's really an honor to, to be here and I think it's particularly appropriate to be talking about the health care case uh, before the American Constitution Society because at issue in this case, I believe, is really a defining principle of the American Constitution, that the federalism structure of the Constitution is itself a guarantee of individual liberty, quite apart from the Bill of Rights. Individual and local freedom is preserved where the limited powers of the federal government do not reach. That guarantee of liberty is expressed in the Tenth Amendment, but it derives from the structure of Article I. And it was, that principle was resoundingly affirmed by Justice Kennedy in his opinion for a unanimous court just last year in Bond versus United States, which held that an individual defendant has standing to claim that a criminal law passed by Congress exceeds Congress's Article I powers and trenches on the police powers of the states. In Bond, Justice Kennedy wrote, quote, federalism protects the liberty of the individual from arbitrary power. When government acts in excess of its lawful powers, that liberty is at stake. And I believe Justice Kennedy recognized that this same principle is at stake with the individual mandate when he stated at oral argument, I understand that we must presume laws are constitutional, but even so, when you are changing the relation of the individual to the government in this unique way, do you not have a heavy burden of justification to show authorization under the Constitution? As a preface to his question, Justice Kennedy asked the Solicitor General to assume what I think is plainly true, that the individual mandate imposes the affirmative duty to act to go into commerce, and that such a mandate is unprecedented in the history of our nation, and is a step beyond the court, what the court's cases have allowed. Here's my second uh, big point with respect to the individual mandate. I think the constitutional issue here is actually not primarily about the Commerce Clause. Rather, this is a case about the necessary and proper clause, and more specifically about what is proper and consistent with the structural guarantees of individual liberty under our Constitution. Requiring, as the mandate does, individuals to enter into a commercial transaction, here the purchase of individual health insurance policies, and requiring them to stay in the market once they've entered, is not a regulation of commerce within the meaning of the Commerce Clause. To regulate commerce means, and always has meant, to prescribe the rules for carrying out commercial activities or to prohibit certain transactions or commercial conduct. No previous act of Congress or decision of the Supreme Court has ever suggested that it, a regulation of commerce could include an affirmative duty for individuals to participate in the marketplace against their will. Instead, as I think actually was clear from oral argument, the Solicitor General's main contention is that the mandate is constitutional because it is necessary to effectuate the insurance reforms 
that are imposed by other provisions of the Health Reform Act, and that's a necessary and proper clause argument. As Congress stated in the Act's findings, by converting health insurance into an entitlement, the guaranteed issue and community rating requirements of the Act create a moral hazard, what Congress in its findings called adverse selection, because they give people a strong incentive to make, as Congress said in its findings, to make an economic and financial decision to forego health insurance coverage and to wait to purchase health insurance until they need medical care. Now the mandate is also designed to subsidize the huge costs imposed on private insurance companies by the guaranteed issue and community rating requirements. This is what Congress meant when it made findings in the act that the mandate is needed to, quote, add millions of new consumers to the health insurance market and to, quote, broaden the health insurance risk pool. As the Washington Post, sorry, Adam, as the Washington Post uh, candidly wrote. You're really undercutting it, your argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not a source I usually cite, but as the Washington Post uh, candidly wrote in an editorial actually supporting the mandate that it published the week of the oral argument, the, the Post said, insurance companies would be unable to offer affordable coverage to those with pre-existing conditions unless they also were guaranteed enrollment of the young and healthy customers who are less likely to consume health care services. That, I think, is the principal purpose of the mandate. The alternative rationale sometimes offered by the government that the mandate is addressing a cost-shifting problem caused by the uninsured is really, I think, just a pretext. As Justice Alito pointed out at oral argument, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that the average premium for a single health insurance policy in 2016 will be around $5,800 per year, while HHS data show that the typical young, healthy individual who is the target of the mandate incurs an average, on average only $854 in annual health care costs, which in fact he usually pays for himself out of pocket. Now, these numbers led Justice Alito to observe the following at argument, quote, what this mandate is really doing is not requiring the people who are subject to it to pay for the services that they are going to consume. It is requiring them to subsidize services that will be received by somebody else. And actually, by the way, one of the government's taxing power arguments is that the mandate has no legal force except as to those individuals who are eligible to pay the tax penalty. In other words, those who can afford to buy insurance, but who choose not to do so. That suggestion, in my view, only reinforces that the mandate is trying to target the young and healthy who would pay more into the system through insurance premiums than they would take out in medical costs, and who therefore make a rational economic choice not to purchase health insurance at the present time. Thus. The true purpose of the mandate is, and this is my description, but I think it's accurate, is to conscript the private economic choices and freedom of individuals in order to address regulatory problems of Congress's own creation. If you, if you view it that way, I think that realization compels the conclusion that the mandate exceeds the bounds of what is proper under the Necessary and Proper Clause. A good illustration of how the current court applies the necessary and proper standard, first articulated by uh, Chief Justice Marshall in McCulloch versus Maryland, uh, is United States versus Comstock, a case from 2010 in which the court held that Congress could provide for involuntary civil commitment of federal prisoners beyond their release dates where they're determined by a judge by clear and convincing evidence to be mentally ill and sexually dangerous and where the states with the relevant interests have been offered the chance but are not prepared to take custody. The court in Comstock found the law satisfied the requirements of the Necessary and Proper Clause for several reasons, which the court laid out. It was supported by a long history of federal involvement through similar enactments. It was reasonably adapted to Congress's responsibilities as a custodian of prisoners. It was narrow in scope and it accommodated state interests. In concurring in the court's uh, judgment, Justice Kennedy, who I, as you can notice, I think is key here, uh, declared 
in the Comstock opinion, it is of fundamental importance to consider whether essential attributes of state sovereignty, and here footnote, I believe he would also add, or individual liberty, are compromised by the assertion of federal power under the necessary and proper clause. If so, that is a factor suggesting that the power is not one properly within the reach of federal power. Similarly, in his concurrence in Comstock, Justice Alito wrote that the necessary and proper clause requires, in the words of Chief Justice Marshall, an appropriate link between a power conferred by the Constitution and the law enacted by Congress. And Justice Alito stated, quote, it is an obligation of this court to enforce compliance with that limitation. So while it's largely for Congress to determine what's necessary for purposes of the necessary and proper clause, there is an essential role for the court in determining what is proper or appropriate in light of the constitutional structure and history. Now here, the individual mandate fails the proper test. It's not an appropriate means for carrying out a legitimate exercise of the commerce power because it uses individuals and their economic liberty as instruments to achieve Congress's regulatory goals and to counter the market dislocations that are created by the act itself. It finds no support in our history since Congress has never assumed a power to force people into commerce, whether to facilitate the regulation of commerce or otherwise. It's not simply incidental in Chief Justice Marshall's terms or reasonably adapted or fitted to a larger legitimate exercise of Congress's enumerated powers because here it itself is a central part of the regulatory scheme. In other words, the court can't assume that the statutory scheme as a whole is within Congress's power without determining the constitutionality of this central feature. It's not narrow in scope because it applies by its terms to almost every American and because it lacks any sound limiting principle. The Solicitor General, in my view, had no clear and coherent answer to Justice Alito's plea for a succinct statement of the limiting principles. And finally, the mandate is not consistent with the letter and spirit of the Constitution, again, as Chief Justice Marshall put it in McCulloch, which guarantees that all economic liberty not specifically ceded to the federal government is retained by the people or reserved to the states in the exercise of their police powers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Walter, did you hear anything you disagreed with? <laughs> what I heard, I think, from, um, from Steve Bradbury was a very um, cogent explanation of what a substantive due process challenge to the individual mandate would be. That's not the challenge that was before the court. And yet what was striking in reviewing the oral argument transcript is how overwhelmingly the questions were actually substantive due process questions that had nothing to do with whether this was within the subject matter scope of a regulation of commerce. And it's the conflation of those issues and the confusing conflation that appears to give traction to two arguments that individually considered have no traction. Let's assume that they, the challengers, had unwisely retained their substance due process challenge that were in some of the complaints filed in the lawsuit. Because that is what is at stake when, when uh, Mr. Bradbury and other justices try to shoehorn Note that I made you into a justice, but <laughs> try to shoehorn into the word proper or in other ways suggest that this, quote, mandate fundamentally alters the relationship of citizen to government. Suppose they brought that, brought that challenge. Is this a fundamental alteration in the relationship of citizen to government? We've completely lost sight of what this provision actually says. It does say that you shall ensure that your, you and your dependents have minimum health insurance coverage. The only, that only applies to those who earn $18,000 a year in interstate commerce and have taxable income because the only enforcement mechanism is a penalty that at its maximum is 2.5% and it's capped even lower than that if you have substantial income. 
And the Solicitor General says in his reply brief, it is the position of the United States that you're fully in compliance with the law if you pay the penalty and choose not to have insurance. And that, coming from the United States, gives you the ability to say, if you decide, I don't want to engage in a private insurance tax action, I'm going to pay the 2.5% penalty. What if you're ever asked, have you ever violated the law? The answer is, no, I have not. See, brief of the United States of America, page 17. Uh, and so I think that's a performative utterance. Fundamentally transform the relationship of citizen to government. When you earn money and go into the workplace, they tell you three things on your first day on the job in the HR office. One is that you have to pay 7.5% in a FICA tax to provide for your old age assistance. Then they tell you there's another percentage you have to pay for a Medicare tax to pay for health care after you're 65. And if you don't have comprehensive health insurance, you have to pay a 2.5% penalty uh, to encourage you to have uh, health insurance before you're 65. No one would say, oh my god, the first two are fine, but the last fundamentally transforms the relationship of citizen to government. <laughs> it's just an incentive to have coverage which you can choose not to have. In the 2,700 pages of this document, I think the only phrase in the English language that does not appear is the phrase individual mandate. That was a creation. It is an incentive. And what's very interesting to me is that uh, in the oral argument, and thank you for suggesting we look through the oral argument, it's very revealing, is that when Paul Clement is asked, could Congress do this through a tax credit? Just do the reverse. He avoids answering that. And Paul never avoids answering something because he's confused. <laughs> it is always strategic. He doesn't answer that because he realizes that once he concedes that Congress can incentivize people to have insurance coverage, the game is over, because that's all that they're doing here. So knowing that this court could not, particularly the four conservatives who don't believe in creating new substantive due process rights, like the right not to have to choose between a 2.5% penalty and having health insurance coverage, mind you, among justices who are fully prepared to think it's not a violation of liberty, for the government to tell your doctor that he has to give you a mandatory lecture before you, you can, before you can have an abortion and force you to watch a sonogram and have the doctor read a script uh, and deny you necessary medical services to think that that's not a problem of liberty, but that the choice between 2.5% and having insurance coverage is, would be a hard act to sustain. So what do you do? You try to push this over to the Commerce Clause. Now, the Commerce Clause issue, I think, I am one of those who have always thought this was an almost frivolous challenge. And I read repeatedly that those who took that position are certainly embarrassed now. They thought this was frivolous when it was brought in. No one is saying that now. I'm saying it now. <laughs> and, I will, <laughs> and I will say it in July no matter what the outcome is. Because the question of whether this is a regulation of commerce it's like asking who's buried in Grant's tomb. It's just a subject matter question. Now, that poses a dilemma for the government. And it's a dilemma that goes back to when I was acting Solicitor General, when Drew Days was Solicitor General, when Seth Waxman was, when Paul Clement was. When the court has got an attitude that pushes you to make a second best argument. Because the first argument the first argument is quite simple. Of course, requiring people or incentivizing people to buy a product in interstate commerce is a regulation of interstate commerce. So to answer all of your hypotheticals, yes. The question is, could Congress do it? Does Congress have the power to do it? Well, there are lots of other constitutional limitations. But is it within the scope of interstate commerce? Yes. Unless you import this backdoor individual liberty issue that never gets examined. So that when Justice Scalia, picking up on a very effective brief, I believe by Stephen Bradbury, weren't you the brief that pointed out the, the subsidy point, the, the, the $5,800 that insurance costs and the 854 that most young people are actually going to consume? Suppose you reverse those figures. Whether it's those figures or reverse figures, it doesn't matter for purposes of the Commerce Clause. It's still a regulation of commerce. When the Social Security Act was challenged in the Supreme Court, the challenger said, 
If it is a regulation of commerce to have a $5 an hour minimum wage, it would be a regulation of commerce to have a $5,000 an hour minimum wage. Well, of course it is. It's equally a regulation of commerce. Now, it might be unconstitutional as being confiscatory, as being a violation of property rights, or on multiple other grounds, but it's equally a regulation of commerce. So I, I, I think in one sense, the, the hard issue is whether um, when you approach an argument like this, to take the initial position is, well, of course it would be a regulation of commerce to incentivize or require people to buy a product in interstate commerce. That's obvious. That's what Justice, that's what Judge Silverman said. That's what Charles Freed said. What are you talking about? Of course it's a regulation of commerce. Now, then you can say, but you don't have, if you want to decide something less than that, you could say that it certainly is a regulation of commerce where the product you're being incentivized to purchase is one which you will inevitably purchase or can't assure that you won't purchase, that when you do purchase it and don't have the means to pay for it, the cost will be transferred to other citizens and where the effect of that is also to undermine a comprehensive regulatory scheme. That's all you have to hold if you don't want to hold the obvious position, as Judge Silverman and former Solicitor Ella Freed said, that it's obviously a regulation of commerce. I found the confusion uh, either deliberate or unintentional between suffusing the simple question of whether this was in the scope of commerce among the states with liberty questions very troubling, and particularly troubling since some of those questions, some of those questions were about individual autonomy, but others were about redistribution. Justice Alito and Justice Scalia kept saying, aren't you requiring one group of people to subsidize another? To which Solicitor General really very effectively responded, that's what the social security system does. It would be an extraordinary return back before 1905 to hold that it is a substantive due process economic violation to have laws the effect of which is to subsidize one group of citizens through a federal regulatory process. You may not like it, but that's surely within the scope of Congress's power. This should be seen as an easy case. Thank you, Walter. Um, so I'm sure Steve has uh, many individual points to rebuttal and they'll come up in due course, but I wanted to turn to some of the actual questions from the justices during the argument and see both what, uh, what our able advocates here, how they might respond, and maybe also if they want to, to comment on what this might tell us about where the court is heading. Uh, this is such a rich field and the, Steve and Walter have made so many good points already, it's hard to know where to start, but maybe I, I want to ask Steve, uh, understanding that he contends that you can't get from here to there through the mandate, are there constitutional ways that the government could achieve the same thing? Or in Justice Ginsburg's words, there's something very odd, she says, that the government can take over the whole thing and we all say, oh yes, that's fine. That's Social Security, that's Medicare. But if the government wants to get to preserve private insurers, it can't do that. How do you respond to that question? Well, certainly Congress could provide for a federal health care program that's funded through general taxation on citizens, and it could focus on just the uh, folks who are going to face uh, health care costs and don't have the means to pay for them. So that's, that's a, a slice, could be a significant slice of uh, those folks who face health care costs, and then preserve and promote a free market for health insurance for everybody who can mm -hmm. afford health insurance by, I mean, this is just a policy matter, not a legal matter, but by uh, uh, requiring that states allow insurance companies from all over the country to sell insurance in their state and not put restrictions on the types of policies that can be offered so you can get a full range of different policies at different price points, et cetera. But the spectrum is, is a broad one of options for Congress. It could have a national health care system where it's all a single payer program uh, run by the federal government and funded by general taxes. Of course, that's politically viewed as not doable and not, not popular. Uh, at the other end, it could do what Walter is just describing. I think not an accurate description of the current law, but it could do it through incentives. And those incentives could include tax incentives, incentivizing people to uh, go out and buy insurance and have insurance in place. It, it could require that when you do uh, 
uh, go into a hospital uh, to, uh, to receive medical care, that you do have insurance at that point to pay for it, and if you don't, there's some financial penalty. It may not have to be draconian, uh, et cetera. So there are incentives mm -hmm. that Congress could, mm -hmm. uh, could adopt for sure. I, uh, when I hear that, Steve, it, it, it does accurately reflect the tone of many of the questions or comments by the justices at the oral argument. And what strikes me about all of these alternative ways that Congress could go about doing it is that here we became the last industrialized country in the world to try to solve the problem of access to health care. Extended insurance to 40 million people, it was one of the most extraordinarily difficult legislative uh, undertakings, uh, certainly in, in my lifetime. And what it sounds to me in your comments and some of the questions is, Congress, you forgot to say, may I? That is, you didn't, you were supposed to say oink, oink three times before doing this, and you didn't do it. You could have done it slightly differently. So that's, I, I mean, that's what I'm hearing when I'm hearing all of this uh, marginal second guessing. No one thinks that this was perfect, but when Congress gets it through, that's why I have such a breathtaking sense of the inappropriateness as a judicial matter of of saying you should have fine-tuned it this way. But let me ask you a particular question. In what sense do you think is this not an incentive to tell people that you have to pay in 2014 $95 if you don't have coverage and to tell people that you have to pay up to 2.5%? Why is that not just an incentive to have coverage? Well, I think Congress called the 2.5% tax a penalty, tax penalty. And the mandate is pretty clear on its face. Thou shalt ensure that you have insurance in place. That is a mandate. I would venture that all of the lawyers in this room, until Don Verrilli got up in the court and said, oh no, it would not be a violation of law to ignore the mandate and pay the penalty. That's not a violation of, of law. I would venture that all the lawyers in this room, in their bar disclosures, if they had ignored the mandate, would view that as a violation of law, would view that as as you're paying a penalty for a violation of law. I, you know, I, I do want to say one thing about the 40 million, 50 million uh, uninsured. The way you've now described the mandate, and actually the way uh, Solicitor General Verrilli described it, in order to try to support the tax power <laughs> argument, actually, uh, you just have reduced the mandate very substantially by saying it only applies to people who right. make above $18,000. If you make below $18,000, you're not even subject to Correct. the mandate. Well, it, hap it happens that people who make less than 18000 account for 15 million or maybe it's 18 million of the uninsured in the right. United States, and they actually are the cohort that produce by far the largest portion of the uncompensated care, the $43 billion figure, mostly right. comes from that cohort. And now, in order to support a tax power argument, to try to preserve this. The government is actually saying it doesn't really do what Congress intended it to do. It, it seems to me that to say that the mandate actually, uh, the tax penalty only applies to the taxpayers and that accounts for only half of the uninsured is to second guess a decision that could not be more quintessentially legislative in nature. And that's what I think suffuses throughout the questions, comments, and arguments made you know, by the justices from the bench is this kind of, of, of micromanaging second guessing. I think on the question of the, of the, the, the mandate, to me it's, it's precatory. I did read it as potentially precatory in the same sense that when I was growing up, it was told you're gonna have to convert to the metric system, we were told in school. By the year 1996 or something, we ha you must go and think in metric terms. Well, there was no penalty attached to that and no one ever, no one would even have standing to sue if they simply said, everyone shall have insurance and there's no penalty at all whatsoever. No one would have standing. The only people that have standing are someone that says, I don't want to pay the penalty. In any event, even if no one thought that before the government filed its reply brief, and I don't concede that, but even if no one thought that before the government filed its reply brief, when the United States of America says, you're in full compliance if you choose to pay the penalty. That's what you get to say on your bar form. You can cite <laughs> reply brief of Solicitor General, page 17, right? For the United States of America. So, uh, the, you know, the Solicitor General was saying that 
in order to say it's a tax. It's an exercise of the tax power. There is an officer in the federal government who happens to be superior to the Solicitor General, that's the President of the United States. Oh, he said in black and white terms, this is not a tax. I think it'll be, it'll be interesting for the court to weigh those, those, uh, those statements. Right. So, I, so I, Justice Scalia, Justice, <laughs> may I interrupt you on the tax thing? Because Justice Scalia, acting as if he were a panelist on a Fox and Friends show, that would make a says, good show. by no means entirely accurately, goes at John Verrilli, the president said it was not a tax. John Verrilli begins to respond by saying, well, First of all, there are two responses to that. He says, first of all, it would, it's what Congress understood that matters. But secondly, he's then cut off by Justice Scalia with another question. That's but the second was going to be, the second was going to be, the president didn't say that. Fox News says the president said that. And you would think, if you're a justice of the United States Supreme Court, in an argument of this importance, and you're going to challenge the Solicitor General of the United States with what the President said, you could ask a law clerk to take the 47 seconds it took me to call up the transcript from ABC and see what the President said. George Stephanopoulos says, you promised not to raise taxes on the middle class. Isn't this a middle class tax increase? And really says, it's not, the President says, it's not a tax increase, any more than it would be if you require people to, to have auto insurance. Nobody thinks of that as a, you know, as a tax increase. Now, you could argue that so in the other president words, it's saying a mandate it's not, to buy insurance. You could argue that the president saying it's not a tax increase somehow undercuts the argument that it's exercising the taxing power. But I would think if you're going to invoke the president, Justice Clue would actually want to, to, to correctly say the president said this wasn't a middle class tax increase. You say, well, that, what does that have to do with whether it's an exercise of the taxing power? But that to me was, a, was a, a, a sense I got of the flavor of the oral argument that I found to be uh, not a great exercise in civics, as people said, but just the reverse. Adam, well, could I make one yeah, last right, point yeah, about yes, the tax? Course. I'm sorry, about the yeah. tax I know thing, and then we'll get who, back. Who, who doesn't want to follow up on the tax point? <laughs> Probably everybody. I'm going to not only shut up, but sit down and shut up. So you, so you might actually uh, agree with, with me on this, and I think uh, it, the way I envision the sequence of decision making for the court, I, th I don't expect the court will decide or would decide the tax power question without first deciding the Commerce Clause question. I, I don't think the, ta the court will get to the tax power issue unless it determines that this is not supportable as an exercise of the Commerce Power. And I think one reason I, I think that's the right way to go is because even though the current penalty is just this tax, that you pay on your tax returns. If this is a legitimate exercise of the commerce power, there would be nothing that would prevent Congress from enforcing it through a criminal provision. They could make this a felony not to have uh, insurance if you can afford it. And that's true for any exercise of the commerce power. Yeah, this is a very important point. And you made this very effectively when we did a mock <laughs> argument that if it's an exercise of the commerce power, instead of $95, two and a half percent, they could say life imprisonment. And it's taken me two months to think of the response to that. <laughs> but, uh, but the response is, you're right that for purposes of whether this is within the commerce power, it clearly wouldn't matter whether there was a $95 penalty or a life imprisonment felony. But that's not the real argument here. When you look throughout the whole argument, it's about how this fundamentally transforms the relationship of citizen to government. And when that's your argument, it does matter that if you don't want to engage in a private transaction, you can just pay the penalty. It is not as if the team that rescued Elian Gonzalez comes and breaks into your house in the middle of the night and force marches you down to Aetna you know, while you're <laughs> holding your children hostage while you sign up for insurance. You just pay the penalty. So I actually think for the, for the sort of is it proper substantive due process subtext, it does matter that the penalty is put at a point if there is this fundamental transformation argument about substantive due process, it very much matters that the penalty is put at a point where you genuinely have a choice of saying, I never want to deal with a private insurance company. I'm going to pay the penalty. So, Walter, I know you've already answered this in a sense. And although somewhat more succinct uh, than Solicitor General Verrilli, uh, 
it did seem to me to be a series of abstract propositions, and I was hoping to wrestle them into actual concrete examples. Uh, the question is the limiting principle question. It was posed at least twice, once by Justice Kennedy <coughs> in this form. Can you identify for us some limits on the Commerce Clause? And then by Justice Alito, could you express your limiting principle as succinctly as you possibly can? Uh, but also, there were quite focused questions about from the Chief Justice, can the government require you to buy a cell phone because that would facilitate responding when you need emergency services? Justice Alito asking whether the government can compel you to buy burial insurance because while most of us, almost all of us will need health insurance, I suppose just about every single one of us will die. And then Justice Scalia, of course, who could resist? Everybody has to buy food sooner or later, so you define the market as food, therefore everyone is the market, therefore you can make people buy broccoli. So I was hoping you might actually give us some examples of what, what's on one side and what's on the other side of your limiting principle. Well, with the benefit of hindsight, reading the, the oral argument transcript, I think the whatever difficulty there is in defining what would be within and without the scope of the, of the commerce power, I think, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, it would be very important to say, uh, Mr. Justice, our first answer is, if the question is, is with this within the subject matter scope of a regulation of commerce, of course it is. Any requirement that you purchase a product in interstate commerce is obviously a regulation of commerce. There may be other challenges to it, but that's it. But you don't need to, it clearly you can define what is different about this, because the other side argues that you're forcing someone into commerce and there's something sort of improper about that. So all you have to say here is that this is commerce in which you will inevitably engage. There may be other examples of that. But it is furthermore, and uh, greatly narrowing the field, commerce which when you engage in it and have not prepared to pay for it, the cost is transferred to other people. And that's that very rare, is that true? And finally, there is, I think, no other case I know of where it undermines a comprehensive regulatory scheme. If there are cases that meet all those criteria, then they would, of course, fall within the principle. Now, to me, to strike this down, because those are clear distinctions. Forcing someone to buy broccoli, uh, if I don't buy broccoli, it looks, if I don't buy a flat screen television, and don't put aside money for it. And lo and behold, my hapless Washington Senators make the World Series. I don't get to rush into Best Buy and say, I've got to have a flat screen television, and I, I didn't put away any money for it. You have to give me one under the, like the equivalent of Impala, the Emergency Flat Screen Television Act. <laughs> you have to provide a flat screen television and impose the cost on the other people who are shopping here today, right? I don't get to do that. That's what happens with healthcare. So I think you could say, if there's something wrong about forcing someone into commerce that is improper under the Commerce Clause, if you go there, then I think you can say, all you have to do is limit this to those who are going to engage in commerce they cannot choose to avoid, where it's going to be provided for them and the cost is going to be transferred to others. And that should be sufficient. But is, not, is the going to be provided to them anyway, is that not a consequence of a, of a legal structure? Yes, boy, this is the one that, um, I saw you writing about this um, every day uh, the last week of the term, and um, I, I, if somebody out there that know, has access to medication to calm one down, I'm, I'm really worried about what I might say before I hit the send button. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to be restrained. But the notion that this is a problem of Congress's creation, when it is said that, you know, we do provide, if you show up, we do provide health care for you at the hospital. And Paul Clement in the 11th Circuit said, one thing Congress could legitimately do is forbid hospitals, reverse symptoms, forbid hospitals to treat people who are uninsured. And the requirement that hospitals treat people who are uninsured, and the new requirement that insurance companies provide insurance to people notwithstanding the fact that they have a pre-existing condition like having had birth by cesarean section, or having asthma or a child born with a birth defect. To call those a problem of Congress's own making, so what if it is? If Congress has a legitimate authority, as it clearly does, to regulate transactions in interstate commerce, 
by requiring that you not discriminate against people who have pre-existing conditions. And if to make that workable, you have to incentivize people to have insurance before they're sick, calling that a, quote, problem of Congress's own creation in no in, by no means should take away Congress's authority. I don't even understand the argument. Every necessary and proper clause provision of a law that could not be independently justified is, I think, a reaction to a problem that Congress has caused in the sense in which they're saying. So are those uh, yeah, yeah. limiting principles persuasive to you? <laughs> well, let me say first that uh, I know, Walter, you really believe in a more frank and candid approach that, in fact, all of those examples that have been paraded out would constitute regulations of interstate commerce. Yes. That Cong okay. Right. And it's that would have but, been. But to say to the court, you don't have to go there if you don't want to. Right. But that would have been an easier, more candid, more direct response to these questions. But I think the Solicitor General, and, and that's the approach that uh, Judge Silberman and Judge Sutton adopted in the, in the lower courts, where they really sort of viewed the Commerce Clause issue as one where, well, there's really not much we can do as lower court judges. And government makes this argument. It's, it is related to commerce. They can basically do anything, including all of these uh, examples. And Judge Silberman actually said there's no limiting principle. There's no limiting principle. I think, I think Solicitor General Verrilli and the government made the correct calculation, right. which is that that ain't going to get five votes on the Supreme Court. You're not going to get an opinion from Justice Kennedy that says it can do this and by the way, there's no limiting principle. Justice Kennedy's not going to say that. And so they had to put themselves in the position of walking the tight, the tight right. wire. And by the way, I don't know how the guy did over in Niagara Falls, but walking the tight, <laughs> the tight wire. Uh, and it, that was a difficult position. And I think, you know, I think Don Verrilli is a great advocate, and I think he did a fine job. I think he did the best he could with the arguments he had. But I do think he's in a real pickle trying to answer the question, what is the limiting principle? It would have been easier to take the approach that I think you personally favor. But the approach, one of the, what it sounds like the approach is, is number one, but Congress decided this is really necessary. This is a big problem and Congress decided it's necessary. Well, that's not a limiting principle because in the next case, Congress d could decide something's even more necessary. Number two, there are unique attributes to the health insurance market. And uh, it's a big market. It's 18% or something of the, of the economy, healthcare generally. And it has these unique uh, attributes. I think perhaps the highlight of Mike Carvin's oral argument was his response on this question, which I think was spot on, which is, OK, if you're going to adopt a rule that draws distinctions for, for Commerce Clause purposes and between industries, then we're really getting back to the old days. When, Congress, when the court tried to draw distinctions between manufacturing and commerce, et cetera, we're, we're right back to those kinds of line drawing. I don't see the, the court ultimately doing that. And then I think really persuasive, in terms of persuasiveness, Paul Clement uh, was, was, was right on. He did a uh, fantastic job. When he points out that when you're talking about economic matters, any time any of us, and certainly if we talk about us in the aggregate as an economy, any time we make a decision, gee, I'm not going to spend those dollars on that new car or this product or that product, we are affecting the costs, the unit costs of that product for everybody else. The unit cost goes up, the economy, there's a drag on the economy, we could be in recession. And if health care is a big economic issue, the overall economy and whether we're in a deep recession, a great recession as we've just been through, is an even bigger economic issue that Congress could try to address. And what more direct way to address it to try to promote economic activity and get us out of the recession than mandating that every family in America who can afford to do so pay a certain, buy a certain amount of products or actually go out in the market in certain ways. Now, maybe it's limited to certain, certain types of industries and products where Congress has some nifty argument that it's peculiar or different, or what, maybe it's in the aggregate across the board. I mean, the same logic would apply, and there really is no there there in terms of these uh, very convoluted and contorted distinctions that the government right. is okay. trying to make. Okay. First of all, um, two of the advocates 
uh, challenging the law, Paul Clement and Antonin Scalia, <laughs> made the made the point, uh, 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 Steve, that 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 you just made that. Why isn't this, the, if the uninsured are causing part of the problem, why aren't those who are not buying cars causing part of the problem? The price of the cars is higher if there are fewer units sold, and therefore compelling people to purchase cars will lower the price you know, for others. And the flip side of that was raised by the Chief Justice, or the complimentary complimentary point by the Chief Justice was that couldn't Congress just have dealt with the problem caused by a guaranteed issue by subsidizing the insurance companies? You're going to be required to cover people. We'll just give you a federal government subsidy. That misunderstands the nature of the problem, fundamentally misunderstands the nature of the problem, which is why justices reading briefs shouldn't be messing in something where health care experts in Congress have been working for 40 years to come up with it. Giving a subsidy, it, it's different in the following sense. And it's demonstrated by the fact that subsidizing insurance companies wouldn't solve the problem. When you have guaranteed issue, you have a product that becomes very de a defective product for a company. Because no one is going to want to buy that product when they can wait and pay for it, when they can wait until they're sick or they're in an accident. And even if you subsidize the insurance companies at a billion dollars a year, it's still going to be a defective product that is undercut and driven down by the fact that you, you have this incentive for people to wait. There's nothing like that. If I don't buy a car, I don't have the right to, guaranteed right to purchase one. It's a fundamentally different way in which it adversely affects the insurance market. And the failure to understand that, when you see justices making policy questions that reflect the fact that they don't think, they don't understand how this is different from the fact that if you buy more of a product, the price goes down. They don't understand the disutility of having guaranteed issue, I think is, you know, is a very, very striking uh, uh, aspect of the policy judgment. Now, on, the, uh, on these untenable distinctions, I understand and I, and I know that, every, that, that the judgment of the Justice Department, and it reflects the judgments made back in my time as well, is that Justice Kennedy will find it unacceptable if you say that all of those incentives to purchase products in interstate commerce is a regulation of commerce. I understand that. And so strategically, it's a very tough question. The benefit of starting with that as your first answer before you go on to the distinctions, to say, look, if you find the distinctions on, you know, I think these distinctions are perfectly principled. The distinction between a product that incentivizing a personal product that you inevitably can't avoid using and, and the cost is something. I think that's a meaningful distinction. It's certainly as principled as many of the distinctions the court comes up with every day and every week. But if it's not a principled distinction, that's not a problem for the government because the government says, we believe you don't have to go to saying that you can incentivize the purchase of any product. We don't believe you have to go there because we believe it's a principled distinction. If you don't agree with that, that's not our problem because this is clearly a regulation of commerce among the states. You're trying to carve out an exception that there's something improper about this way of regulating commerce among the states. Let me follow we up. say you can limit that. Let me follow up on that question about who bears the burden here. And let me read an extended passage, and Steve has alluded to this uh, from Justice Kennedy, because it gives you a sense of what his thinking is and where the burden is and what the standard of review might be. He asks this question, I wonder how you'd answer it, uh, Walter, but don't fight the premise. Uh, he says, assume for the moment that this is unprecedented. This is a step beyond what our cases have allowed, the affirmative duty to go, to act, to go into commerce. If that is so, do you not have a heavy burden of justification, you the government? I understand that we must presume that laws are constitutional, but even so, when you are changing the relation of the individual to the government in this, what we can stipulate is, I think, a unique way. Do you not have a heavy burden of justification to show authorization under the Constitution? Well, the two parts of that, uh, the two parts of that, Your Honor, uh, the first part. I like it. The first part is whether it's novel. Do you have a, 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 a greater burden of justification? That is not a question that, that the court put to the advocates who argued for the National Labor Relations Act 
who argued to defend the Social Security Act, who argued to defend the Medicare Act. Every new enactment is novel, and they've never been uh, asked to say for that reason. Yes, it's novel because we're the last country in the industrialized world to do this, and secondly, we've never used the free market mechanism before uh, to deal with national social problems. But the second part of your question is, uh, I'm afraid I simply cannot accept, I, I do agree with you. If the question is, does a provision that fundamentally transforms the relationship to citizen to government require the government to have an extraordinary burden of justification, the answer to that question would be yes, it does. This is not such a case. Paying a penalty to have insurance does not fundamentally transform the relationship of citizen to government the way it does when government intrudes into the conversation between doctor and patient, for example. Now, I wouldn't have said that in court, but I <laughs> couldn't, couldn't resist. I think you would have. What, what do you think of the heavy burden? Yeah, he might. What do you think of the heavy burden of justice? Is this going to be the undue burden of the, uh, of the Commerce Clause? Well, listen, I, I started with this point, and I think it's central. Uh, certainly the way Justice Kennedy is viewing the case, as indicated, I mean, I think these were sincere, he's very troubled. This was, these were sincere questions he was, he was asking. And I think what this gets to, Walter, is that what I'm trying to communicate is there is an individual liberty interest in the federalism structure of Article I of the Constitution. And the enumerated limited powers of Congress creates a liberty interest that we all share in. Now, that's, it's, it's independent of substantive due process uh, under the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment, which, again, as you know, is, as you've referenced, for, for, for example, with uh, abortion limitations imposed by state law, is something that is typically brought to bear in a challenge to a state law. And if, if somebody felt that an individual mandate imposed by a state to buy health insurance violated substantive due process, they'd be free to challenge that exercise of the state's police power. This is different. This is what does the court reference, what does it look to, what are its benchmarks when it's deciding is this a proper exercise of Congress's incidental sweeping authority under the Necessary and Proper Clause or the Sweeping Clause as an adjunct to some enum exercise of enumerated power by Congress, which here is the guaranteed issue in community rating requirements. And, and on that, I just want to say one thing to clarify, because I think that there's a, a confusion here. Um, when I say this is a problem of Congress's creation, I'm not referring to a background policy that we give emergency s stabilization care to the seriously acutely ill when they walk into a hospital. I'm talking about the guaranteed issue in community rating insurance regulations that Congress is imposing in this act, in other provisions of this act, and creating the problem that the mandate is intended to try to, to resolve. As to the background rule, like under the federal EMTALA statute and state and state law, that if you or I are seriously ill, acutely ill, and we walk in and we need acute care in an emergency room, there's a legal obligation of the hospital, even if we don't have insurance, to provide us stabilization care to get us stabilized. That, uh, that background rule only accounts for a small fraction of the costs that Congress is is focusing on here that are attributable to to the uninsured. For example, the young and healthy who are the targets, the subject of the mandate, on average, as you might expect, not really a surprise, on average, the young and healthy American incurs $56 a year in emergency care costs, and they pay for it out of pocket. Uh, so that's a very small fraction of the issue that the, that the mandate is is addressing, and I think that's kind of a a red herring. Right. All right. Uh, yeah, that you make, uh, there's a point you make that, that I think is, is very effective and very, very tricky and difficult for me to respond to. Um, and if I, had a, if I had a crystal response, I would, have, I would have published it between the oral argument and now, and that is this. I say, I begin by saying that where this case really went off the rails is when the court uh, justices Alito Scalia, but especially Kennedy, kept infusing this simple subject matter jurisdiction question with substantive process liberty questions. And that if you 
broke out that confusion, this would seem to be an easy case. Steve makes the very effective point that there is a liberty protecting aspect to federalism and the limits on congressional power. And certainly Justice Kennedy is very wedded to that concept and has repeated it time again. And that's a difficult question to respond to, but what I want to say is, look, I understand, Justice Kennedy, that you believe and correctly believe that there is a liberty protecting aspect to the limits on congressional power. But that's not really the liberty interest that's at issue in this case. That is a liberty interest that comes up, a protection of liberty interest in cases like Morrison and Lopez. Morrison and Lopez are cases where everybody conceded that what was being regulated, violence against women, an act of violence on a local street, or someone walking down a street 100 yards from a school with a weapon in his, or gun in his pocket, that no one would say that those are, that that is commerce among the states. So there, it's outside the box defined by commerce among the several states. It, there was no element of movement in interstate commerce. It wasn't an interstate commercial transaction. So the only question was whether it's something that is outside the box of interstate commerce can be regulated because it has influence on things inside. The quality of education and how that enhances productivity, the ability of women to work freely in all kinds of jobs and all different shifts, that there is that effect. And the court wanted a very strong argument of the nexus between that regulation and inside commerce. And they insisted on that in Morrison and Lopez, and nothing in this case remotely challenges the limits articulated in Morrison and Lopez about regulating that which appears outside it. But the regulation by requirement or incentive of a purchase in interstate commerce is inside the box. It is a regulation of commerce. So that liberty protecting interest is at stake here. You're really talking about something quite different, a substantive due process limitation and that is reflected very strongly in Justice Kennedy's question. Um, uh, it requires the, this requires the end, what is concerning about this rule, says Justice Kennedy, is that it requires the individual to do an affirmative act. In the law of torts, our tradition, our law has been that you don't have the duty to rescue someone if that person is in danger the blind man walking in front of a car and you do not have a duty to stop him, absent some relation between you. And there's some severe moral criticism of that rule, but that's generally the rule. And here the government is saying the individual citizen must act and that is it. Now that is a core individual autonomy kind of interest. It has nothing to do with whether it's being done by the national government or the state government. That's about individual autonomy. It's not about this. And it's the confusion of that into this simple question. As it is when, uh, and, and I must say, Steve's, I think, maybe had the most, of, certainly on the other side, I thought the most effective amicus brief, because Justice Alito made very effective use of your brief in his questions about the degree of cross-subsidization uh, cross of the young and healthy, of the older uh, 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 and infirm. But that is a different kind of substantive due process concern, not one that goes to sort of autonomy of action, but one that goes to the notion that, that, it, that redistribution raises problems of substantive due process, a road I thought we had abandoned in 1938, uh, and yet we may be poised to return to it again. Can I just uh, sure. uh, respond? My, my point is that the liberty interest that we're referring to comes into play through the necessary and proper clause analysis. Lopez and Morrison were not necessary and proper clause cases. Those were commerce clause cases. There was no larger program or regulatory scheme that, uh, and there was no claim that the gun restriction or the domestic violence cause of action were necessary to effectuate some larger scheme, which is a necessary and proper clause argument. Instead, it was a direct, straightforward challenge under the Commerce Clause. Congress, this is not commerce. It doesn't have a sufficient connection to commerce. You can't do what you're doing. It's not a regulation of commerce because there's no connection. That's not, so that, I, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't bring to bear the same analysis that refers to the liberty interests of federalism uh, in the same way, because here I think it comes in through the, the word proper in the necessary and proper clause. That's my, that's my supposition. If I could put a question to you, let me raise a question that, that struck me this morning 
reading through the transcript of something that isn't asked in the transcript, which would be the following question. Assuming that there is real salience to the point that you can't force someone who is inactive and simply wants to be let alone, you can't push those people into a market, and that there's someone who's not going to use the healthcare system, who is somehow going to have the ability to pay for it no matter what the catastrophic. Imagine such a person could make out the case. They're not within the exceptions for Christian scientists or others to make out the case. Why can't that person bring an as-applied challenge? In other words, uh, there are many, many of the people covered by the requirement of people who have insurance that doesn't meet minimum coverage standards. And that's clearly a regulation of people who are in commerce. There are people who have had insurance and who've dropped it. There are people who have already have outstanding medical bills that they've demonstrated they are uh, 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 unable to pay. So that uh, it struck me, that were it not for the fact that no one raises the question, that one very sort of intermediate way to resolve this case is, well, we don't know whether you could take someone who's living in the woods and inactive and, and force them to engage in, in, a, in a product, but we don't have such a person in front of us. We've got 26 state attorneys general, every single one of whom has health insurance. Now, they can't raise this question. So we are leaving open the question of whether someone might bring an effective as applied challenge in 2016 when, they're for, when they refuse to pay the $95 or whatever it's moved up to, they refuse to pay it and they want to make out the case that they are totally and can, and can demonstrate they're going to remain outside this market We'll hear that case, and maybe it would be beyond Congress's power to regulate it, but that's not the case that's before us. And if you'll look at all of our abortion cases, you'll see we are very strict about who can bring facial challenges and who can bring as-applied challenges. And of course, this fails as a facial challenge because there are many people who quite appropriately, uh, even if we grant almost everything you say challenges, right appropriately be brought. So, I'm, I'm wondering whether it, it, a sort of a, a, a non-dramatic outcome would be we reject the facial challenge and await an as-applied challenge if anyone wants to bring one. It would and I would still think that would be the case, enough. but nobody raised it. Uh, uh, so and and it's particularly curious because it did figure in Judge Sutton's opinion. What, what's your response to that, Steve? Well, I think the members of this society would find life a lot less interesting if we couldn't bring facial challenges under Article I to uh, large statutes uh, enacted by Congress. I mean, this, a, a much less dramatic outcome would be a lot less fun, right? Um, but a, a, an as-applied challenge assumes that the overall regulatory scheme is constitutional. That's the framework, for example, that you saw in the case brought by Angel Rach, the marijuana case where she assumed, the case assumed, and the court accepted that the overall interstate prohibition on marijuana possession and, and sale was constitutional. And the question was, but what about her? She's just growing it for her own use in her closet or in her basement and using it herself for medicinal purposes consistent with state law. So it's an as-applied challenge to her. And of course, then it gets into the substantial effects question that was that was at issue there. But ordinarily, when the issue is, is this a statute that's authorized, is this a scheme that is authorized in whole or in the central part by Article I, that's appropriate for facial challenge. And for example, in Lopez, there was no question whether the particular gun that was possessed in violation of the law in Lopez had traveled in interstate commerce. It might well have, and of course, Congress later amended the statute in response to Lopez to limit its application to guns that had traveled in interstate commerce. We have that prohibition today. So uh, I think, uh, and as you've seen, as you indicated, Walter, I don't think there's one, well, maybe there was one, but I don't think there are any members of the court who are thinking this isn't appropriate to address as a facial matter. And I think they're going to reach the issue. And I think we're going to have a big case. And either way it comes out, it's going to be a very big case. And I think very important for individual liberty and for well, power of Congress. Well, if, this is if, a huge if, case. If I were really cynical, and, I, and, and this is my, but I'm not, uh, I'm not, there's some, but not much cynicism in me. So I don't think this is what the court's going to do. But a really, a partisan court, which I've never thought 
this court to be. I think it's the inappropriate, inappropriate substitution of their own policy judgments for that of Congress, but I don't think it's partisan. But if they were partisan, what it would do, part one would say this clearly would violate the, it would be an improper part of the necessary and proper clause. It's clearly beyond Congress's commerce power. They're forcing people into commerce. They could never do that. That's part one. Part two says, however, what this law really is, it's a tax increase. The president raised your taxes and he lied about it. Okay, <laughs> so it's upheld, and they don't have to reach the severability or anything else. But that would be that would be sort of the worst political outcome. The president raised your taxes and lied about it, uh, as uh, uh, you know, as there as is one an problem opinion. with that, though. Then they have they do have to reach the Medicaid expansion. They still have to reach the Medicaid expansion. We're not going to debate right. today, but I happen to think is actually a, a difficult issue. All right, why don't we um, turn to questions from you all? Uh, please wait for a microphone to reach you, and please keep your questions short and in, in the form of a question. I see someone back, back there. Hi, thanks, Adam Winkler. Um, I think one of the unfortunate aspects of this case is that there's been so much examination of the government's limiting principles and almost no examination of the opponent's limiting principles. So the argument is that the government can regulate voluntary commercial activity, but can't regulate inactivity or force people into commercial activity. But it seems to me that Chief Justice Roberts' question about a cell phone or Justice Scalia's question about broccoli are problems that are faced by the opponents as well. Uh, if you want to make people buy broccoli, you just tie it to the voluntary commercial purchase of food that every single human being does. You buy $50 worth of food a week, then you have to buy $10 worth of broccoli. If you buy uh, $50 a month of telephonic services, as almost everyone does, then you have to buy a cell phone for your emergency uh, possession. It seems to me that the inactivity-activity distinction does absolutely nothing to preserve individual liberty in the way that the opponents have suggested. So I'm just curious, Mr. Bradbury, uh, what would be your answers? What are your limiting principles, and how do they really preserve individual liberty in the way that you suggest? Well, I, I don't think the examples you gave would be permissible uh, for, con for a federal statute to require if you buy $50 worth of groceries, you have to buy $10 worth of broccoli. That's not a regulation of commerce uh, uh, for the same reasons. I think it would be unprecedented. It would, the, the same principles would apply. My two principles would be Congress can't force you to engage in commercial transaction in order to achieve a regulatory purpose. And number two, Congress can't impose a mandate like this to address a problem that's of Congress's own creation. Here, the market dislocations caused by the guaranteed issue and community rating provisions. And I, those are two clear principles, and they don't turn on uh, is the broccoli green? They don't turn on is the ind industry insurance? They don't turn on is there a background rule that you're guaranteed care, uh, that you're going to get care in an emergency hot? They don't turn on particular circumstances that are sliced and diced. They're pretty clear. And by the way, they're completely consistent with the history of the country because we're not faced with a situation where there's a long history of examples of this ki these kinds of mandates and we're, we're announcing some radical new rule that calls into question uh, whole channels of uh, regulatory activity that we've come to uh, uh, rely upon. This is, this is a step further, as Justice Scalia said. This goes a step beyond what has ever been addressed by the court before. I don't disagree uh, w with Steve that the, that the arguments he's making would allow him to encompass the examples that Professor Winkler put forward. But I think Professor Winkler's comment is devastating to the argument that had the most popular saliency, which was that to regulate, quote, inactivity is at the end of the universe because as as Adam points out, that's a principle that does no meaningful work because you could say, well, then everybody that has to buy one car has to buy two. Uh, it doesn't. It, it it doesn't provide anything. And and that whole inactivity argument, it, it sounded like that must be the most extreme thing government could do. But it's just another. It's a very clever way of identifying an affirmative obligation. An affirmative obligation <coughs> is. Uh, a regulation of 
of inactivity uh, in the sense that you want to be left alone and you're required to go and do something. And that may require greater justification, but one that's easily met here. Yes, sir. Uh, since uh, Justice Kennedy threw the door wide open by comparing it to tort duty, uh, if you throw that door wide open, I can think of two instances where the federal government uh, compels citizens to act affirmatively. One is when they conscript and compel citizens to go overseas and kill our enemies, which is a much greater penetration and reach than just you know, having to pay an incentive fee. And the other is if the federal government under the Public Safety Act decides to quarantine or isolate you, you're forced to purchase goods within the institution where you're isolated under the Commerce Clause. Uh, I don't think either is an ex I wouldn't say either is an exercise of the Commerce Clause, actually. The first one is very clearly an exercise of Congress's enumerated power under Article I to raise and provide for uh, an army and a navy. And that gives Congress the authority, like it or not, to impose a draft, because that's raising an army or a navy. So that's right there in the Constitution. The same goes for some of the arguments that have been made uh, from time to time about the militia. Because, you know, back in 1789, we had a federal statute that required all able-bodied males to own a long arm rifle for militia service. But again, there are two clauses in the Constitution, Article I, that gives Congress the enumerated power to raise and to provide for and to regulate the militia so that it can be called into federal service and it's ready to go. So that you falls know, into that category. In terms of the, in terms of the uh, inoculation and the border control issues, I really would focus those on uh, the, the power to address a national security issue, like a pandemic situation. I know the question was raised in oral argument about suppose 60% of the population came down with uh, 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 bird flu or something, and it was a huge it was a huge problem. The typical way that would be handled, of course, is that first and foremost, the states would require inoculations, vaccinations, etc. The federal government would assist the states by uh, controlling border uh, flow, individuals crossing borders who haven't been inoculated, etc., in support of the states. But I think if push came to shove, the federal government could require emergency actions to address the pandemic, including inoculations, uh, that's not requiring somebody to engage in a commercial transaction. I think that's addressing a, uh, a national and national security threat in the form of pandemic. I mean, Homeland Security does pandemic uh, planning and games all the, all, all the time. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree that you're talking about an exercise of militia power. But the structure of the argument made by the critics is that even assuming you're regulating commerce by requiring people to engage in commerce, it's unthinkable if you're doing it by regulating, quote, inactivity. And the militia example is salient here because when Congress adopted the law requiring everyone to have not only a gun, but ammunition and a knapsack, it was an exercise of militia power. No one said, oh my God, we're regulating inactivity. Uh, we're using the militia clause to regulate inactivity. We can regulate inactivity. There's no limits. It was just an affirmative obligation. Well, you haven't heard me focusing no, I have on not. the activity, I, 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 inactivity, inactivity. You and I will have say, been very wise in not as, going that way. As route. often happens in Supreme Court cases, by the time the issue gets focused and crystallized before the court and it's gone through layers of argument, the, the arguments get refined on both sides. And I actually think, you know, Don Verrilli refined his arguments from the arguments right. that Neil Katyal was making in the 11th Circuit and the D.C. Circuit, and the challengers also refined and focused their arguments. And I think what you heard from Paul Clement was this individual liberty uh, 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 focus that, uh, that I'm trying to stress. Let's have a question up here, Peter Edelman. Would you wait for the microphone? Walter, I wonder whether uh, you would have, uh, on behalf of the government, formulated the severability issue differently from the way they did. Uh, no, I don't think so, uh, Peter. But would you take the microphone back? Because I think Peter has in mind a different way to formulate it. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm not, I, the, way, the way I would have formulated it uh, is, uh, is simply that uh, if the mandate is unconstitutional, the mandate is unconstitutional and nothing else is. Ah, okay, here's the, uh, I think this is a, a very tricky <laughs> question of, of strategy. The, the 11th Circuit held that the mandate is invalid but that everything else stands. 
the government took the position, and I think it's the right answer. Uh, I'm not talking about strategy, but, it, but it, the right answer is, I don't see how you could justify, in light of what Congress said, telling insurance companies you have to insure people at the moment they show up without providing some incentive for people to do so in advance of necessity. So that if you, uh, the question is, would Congress have, would Congress have enacted, would Congress have enacted a requirement that insurance companies serve everybody that shows up and not change the rates if it did not have any incentive? And the answer looks like Congress would not have done that because not only does it seem like unfair to insurance companies, but that in Congress has referred repeatedly to the states where they did have a guaranteed issue without any incentive system, where the system just quickly eroded over time as more and more people decided to stay out until they were sick. The, the, the population paying premiums, it began like saying, you, you have to issue fire insurance to people after their house is caught on fire. Uh, and nobody would bother to buy it in, in, in advance and people would pay their $100 premium and get their $500,000 for their house. It's, it's just unworkable. So I, I, I think that is the, uh, the case. Now, I could imagine the court saying, we're just going to strike down the mandate. I mean, I, I felt sort of better about the government's chances after Wednesday than I did after Tuesday of the oral argument. Uh, though, in reading the transcript again, uh, uh, I thought the, it was a much more open question about what the court would do reading the transcript and being in the courtroom, where mm -hmm. the feeling of, of the sort of hostility well, we to the government's a, argument was palpable. But, but I, thought, I, I thought, Steve, after Wednesday, when, uh, uh, after the severability argument, I just thought, what an incredible mess the court is going to have on its hand if they invalidate but, the Steve, the, do you have a quick mandate. answer to how much of the law should go if the mandate goes? The, the whole law. And we filed a brief that, that showed if you look at all the different major provisions and you analyzed it in terms of uh, what financial burdens do they impose on the private insurance companies and what monetary benefits do they provide over the 10 years, and CBO scored this, voila, it's rough, it roughly balances. Congress meant this to work uh, all together, and Congress said expressly the guaranteed issue and community rating cannot work without the mandate. So I think those those fall, and the government couldn't argue anything else because of its necessary and proper clause argument. And when, was it Bartow Farr? When Bartow Farr took the position defending the 11th Circuit, he got almost no questions from the court. And I think that's a telltale right. indication that he isn't going to get one He vote. did an excellent job he of did. coming he up with an argument that nothing else should fall. <laughs> uh, now, what's in, I think on this point of severability, there is a political point to be made, and, and the one criticism I would have of the administration, and I've had since the week the lawsuit was filed, is they let this be about the individual mandate. I thought that the President of the United States should have gone into the noon press briefing the day after the suit was filed and said, yesterday, 25 state attorneys general filed a lawsuit, and if they are successful, what it will mean is that if you've had asthma, you can be denied health insurance for the rest of your life. If you have given birth by cesarean section, you can be denied health insurance for the rest of your life. If you have a child born with a birth defect, you can be charged exorbitant premiums you cannot possibly afford for the rest of your life. That is what they will accomplish if they succeed in this lawsuit. And those are overwhelmingly popular. And they are, I think, all sides agreed, inextricably intertwined. And why? The White House let the debate be about the one unpopular part and not the inextricably intertwined parts is a political mystery to me, unless they thought that nobody was going to notice this, uh, nobody would pay it, nobody would notice this lawsuit if they just didn't say anything about it. <laughs> Maybe way back in the corner. Hi, I have a question about the limiting principle, uh, which I think is in part a question about the necessary and proper clause. I, I don't understand the need for a limiting principle. I, I think, isn't the limiting principle democracy? I mean, wh wh why, why, I understand why it became an issue in the court and in the argument, but as a matter of analysis, w what in the Constitution requires that principle? Uh, your copy of the Constitution is not the same one that Justice Kennedy has. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, essentially the problem, I think, for, 
for the government, the notion that there needs to be an articulated limiting principle. And I think when you're within, when the question is one of subject matter jurisdiction, essentially using that term in its non-technical sense, um, you know, and the court at one time didn't take those slippery slope arguments seriously. Another example, when the Social Security law was challenged in the court, the challenging advocate began his argument by saying, if Congress can pass an age 65 retirement and require those under 65 to subsidize the retirement of those over 65, they can set the retirement age at 25 and make everybody, you know, between 21 and 24 pay for everybody else. And the court thought, yeah, they could. I mean, it got nowhere. It got no traction whatsoever. Uh, because, of course, when the question is, is a regulation of commerce a regulation of commerce, you can always come up with regulations of commerce which seem extreme and which I think would very often lead to um, um, other constitutional challenges. I think, Steve, by the way, one of the problems I think defenders have is that I have thought that the court went a little too far in abandoning review of economic due process in 1938 through the justice through my clerk, Justice Black. And therefore, if there was a little <laughs> bit more, more bite to economic due process, you wouldn't have to worry about those things that seem like Here this you gross go with wealth substantive transfers. Due process again. Right, I mean, really it's a, it's, it's how, it's how do you answer that question, though? Does, does this limiting principle point really have do work in the argument? Do we oh. need one? Does the court do work? I mean, I do think the Solicitor General's first answer to the limiting principle is, well, hey, well, wait a minute. Congress said this is really important. It's necessary, and you got to defer to Congress. And Congress isn't going to do wacky things like broccoli and electric cars. You know, Congress is going to be careful and only do it when it's really important. That isn't, I don't think that's going to fly with five justices of the court because, as James Madison said in the Federalist Papers, Congress, the legislature is the impetuous vortex. And if, if the limiting principle is whatever Congress thinks is right is gonna fly, then there really are no structural limitations. There's nothing to the enumerated power limitations. Instead, as Chief Justice Marshall said in Marbury versus Madison, it is the province of the court to say what those limitations are, what the law requires and what the law permits is for the court ultimately to decide, and I don't think this court is going to say there are, there are, uh, there are no uh, limits. As to the democracy question, I do want to say this is almost a point of personal privilege about Don Verrilli's argument. He had among uh, the transcript shows, I think, a really incredibly well-developed sense of how this whole market operates and why it is so fully within Congress's power. I think on Wednesday. His closing on Wednesday may be as good a closing of an oral argument as I have heard an advocate make. He said, I'd like to take half a step back here because it's important as the court is considering these issues that it be kept in mind that within the population of Medicaid eligible people who will receive health care they cannot now afford are millions of people with chronic conditions like diabetes and heart disease. And as a result of the health care they will get, they will be unshackled from the disabilities that those diseases put on them and have the opportunity to enjoy the blessings of liberty. And the same thing is true for a husband whose wife is diagnosed with breast cancer and who won't face the prospect of being forced into bankruptcy and try to get care for his wife and face the risk of having to raise his children alone. In this very fundamental way, this Medicaid expansion, as well as the provisions we discussed yesterday, secure the blessings of liberty. The Congress struggled with the issue of how to deal with the profound problem of 40 million people without health care for many years, and it made a judgment that this was the best complex of options. Maybe they were right, maybe they weren't, to go to your point. But this is something about which the people of the United States can deliberate and they can vote, and if it needs to be changed, they can change it. And I would urge the court to respect that judgment and uphold this law. I thought it was very, very powerful. It was very, it was very eloquent, and I think court being the court will say if the issues are that important and the policy judgments need to be made to address these national problems, Congress will readdress the issue. Well, I can hardly imagine a more illuminating uh, conversation. In uh, less than two weeks, we'll have an actual answer <laughs> to what the court's going to do. In the meantime, please join me in uh, thanking our <laughs>